I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's presentation with um, Zach Kaufman. Um, my name is T. Lamb, and I'm a professor of philosophy at Sanchez Central College. I'm also a member of the Board of Directors of Central American United for Separation of Church State um, Houston chapter. Um, tonight's presentation is co-sponsored by the Houston AU, as well as Rice ACLU and Rice Empower. And before we uh, start, I'd like to ask Life to come up and say a few words about AU. Thank you. My name is Glenn Hatman. I'm on the board for the Houston chapter of Americans United. Uh, for those who are not, uh, are not members, uh, it's Americans United for the Separation of Church and State. And as our name implies, our biggest interest is the separation of church and state, keeping government out of religion and keeping religion out of the government. And that's what we fight for and that's what we work for. Uh, we, AU, we commonly refer to it as AU, does get involved in litigation, but that's through our national office in Washington, in Washington D.C., where Barry Lynn is the executive director, and there's a legal staff there that does uh, the legal work that's necessary. On the local level, it's primarily we're involved with education, informing people such as this, uh, putting on a program with Zach, to explain more about uh, our interest in church and state, or separation of church and state. For those who are not members, we have a couple of brochures there that are back there that are the applications for membership we'd like you to join. I also have copies of the Church and State magazine, which comes to every member uh, on a monthly basis. And then there's other brochures there that explain the issues that we are most involved in. So, I think that, uh, okay. Tonight's uh, presenter is uh, Mr. Zach Coplin, who is an educational um, activist. He is a sophomore majoring in history here at Rice since 2010, when he was a senior at Baton Rouge Magnet High School. Zach has led an effort to repeal the Louisiana Science Education Act, which, according to the American Association for Advancement of Science, introduces religious, unscientific views into public school science classrooms. He testified in front of the Louisiana Board of Elementary and Secondary Education <coughs> as part of a successful effort to maintain science-based textbooks in Louisiana public schools. And more recently, Zach has begun documenting private schools that teach creationism or use creationist curricula while receiving public funds through voucher programs. In recognition of his education and advocacy work in 2012, Zach received the Friend of Darwin Award from the National Center for Science Education, the Hugh Hefner First Amendment Award in Education, and the Troublemaker of the Year Award, which celebrates teenagers whose advocacy uh, delivers tangible positive impact on their local community, hometown, country, and perhaps the entire planet, which is very impressive. Um, recently, he wrote an open letter to President Obama in the Huffington Post calling for a second child leap for mankind that fights science-denying legislation and increases funding for scientific research over the next 10 years. And this coming Friday, uh, Zach will be on the Bill Mayer Show on um, HBO. Okay. Zach. Hey, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here so I can tell you all about our fight for science in Louisiana and across the country. So for me, how many of you all are interested in public service? Because too often, my generation maligns public service and politics. We don't read the news. We look down our noses at activists. We think politicians are all corrupt and power hungry. It's the wrong attitude. And to me, voting science is actually at the core of service, whether you're an elected official or an activist or a student or a parent or anyone. And science is really vital for us to create a better future for humanity. And initially, I didn't understand this. I'll give you an anecdote about my life. For my entire life, my dad has been involved in the top levels of Louisiana politics, and I grew up living and breathing politics. He was the chief of staff for two different governors, and I hated it. When I was 14, I, and I was a freshman in high school, he ran for Congress. I was supposed to pass out campaign flyers to all my friends and teachers. I didn't. <laughs> Putting a campaign t-shirt on my cat who a dog, and letting her roam our local soccer fields actually got him more votes than I ever did. <laughs> At 14, the truth is, I want my dad to lose, and he did. 
I knew he was the best candidate in the race. I knew he would have been an amazing congressman, but this wasn't about him, it was about me. So, in my embarrassing shyness, I did not want to be that kid, the kid with the congressman for a father, the privileged kid. I didn't understand public service. Fast forward about six months though, and that, th this is the beginning of my evolution. My state passed a creationism law. So that summer, every year I went up to camp in Connecticut, but that summer I introduced myself differently. I said, I'm Zach, I'm from Louisiana, but I'm not stupid. And I, I said that because of this creationism law. And I, I, the Louis it's the Louisiana Science Education Act. And I knew my peers around the country had heard about it. It was in the New York Times, it was all over. And I was embarrassed. I had kids ask me, like, what is your state doing? Do you actually believe this? And so, so I actually started introducing myself differently. And I, I was still shy. I was still immature. I hadn't really learned to love all the good things about my state, I mean, the food, the people, the music. But I hadn't learned to love them while fighting the bat. This law, it would make me eventually learn that, though. So Louisiana, my state, is addicted to creationism. Back in 1987, our first creationism law, the Balanced Treatment Act, was thrown out by the Supreme Court in Edwards versus Aguilar. And so when we passed the Louisiana Science Education Act, we became repeat offenders. And I won't lie, the Louisiana Science Education Act is a really clever piece of legislation. It never once mentions creationism or intelligent design, because it's dodging court rulings like the Edwards one from Louisiana, and the more recent court ruling, um, the Kitzmiller versus Dover trial, which said creationism Intelligent design is just creationism except dressed up to look scientific, but still patently unconstitutional. Instead, the Louisiana Science Education Act allows creationism to be taught through a loophole. It allows supplemental materials into public school science classrooms to, quote, critique politically controversial, not scientifically controversial, but politically controversial material like evolution and climate change. And so, Throughout the bill and all the talking points of its proponents, there's a lot of talk about critical thinking and academic freedom. And so, critical thinking is absolutely wonderful. That's, we're all, everyone, that's what we want to teach our students. But you don't need a law to teach critical thinking. That's the nature of science. You only need a law if you want to sneak unscientific alternatives into public school science classes. And so make no mistake, the Louisiana Science Education Act is a creationist law. When the bill was first introduced by Senator Ben Nevers, Senator Nevers left the cat out of the bag, and he explained a creationist group, the Louisiana Family Forum, who, by the way, this group claims to have drafted and promoted the Louisiana Science Education Act. Um, they asked for the law so that creationism could be taught with Darwinism in public school science classes, is what he said. So, from the beginning, they were blatant about it. When the Louisiana State Board of Education originally wrote the rules to implement this law, they specifically outlawed creationism and intelligent design from being taught under it. That didn't last. The creationists got, went berserk. They got those rules scrapped. And so now, even the last offense against creationism and intelligent design under this law got thrown out. And so, despite all the talk about critical thinking, it's crystal clear that teaching creationism is what this law is about. And it gets even more plain when you consider what Livingston Parish in Louisiana, their school board did back in 2010, where they held a meeting on the Louisiana Science Education Act and discussed how they could make creationism part of their curriculum limit. So, so it's plain exactly what this law is for. And so among all the flaws of this unconstitutional law, the worst is that by miseducating our students and teaching them creationism is science, we'll confuse them about the nature of science and the scientific method. See, science is simply the way we explain natural phenomena. Our explanations can be tested, and these tests can be repeated. Science is falsifiable, which means that if we conduct a test, there's a specific set of results that will prove this test wrong, and we have to re-explain the natural phenomena. Um, science is always expandable. No matter what we discover, I think this is the most beautiful thing about science, no matter what we discover, no matter how much we know, there will always be something new. New discoveries will always be opened up. And so creationism meets none of these requirements. It's not science. And teaching our students to ignore the scientific method will confuse them in all their future scientific endeavors. Now fortunately, here in Texas, <laughs> the Republican Party, if the Republican Party has its way, we won't even need to worry about creationists using critical thinking to sneak creationism to the classes. As I'm sure many of you are aware, they don't even believe in critical thinking. Um, the Texas GOP adopted a party platform and said, we oppose the teaching of higher order thinking skills, critical thinking skills, and similar programs. <laughs> so maybe that explains 
why the creationists have not been successful with the stealth creationism law in Texas. I mean, they usually just say straight, they don't do all the critiquing and supplemental materials like we've done in Louisiana. They just say straight out, we want creationism. And that doesn't really pass. Uh, so despite that, I expect, we may not see one, we may be lucky this year, now that we've gotten through part of the session, we may not see a creationism bill. And, but, you know, coming back 2015, well, we may, who knows what's going to throw up. We have the Zedler bill this year, which wasn't specifically for public schools, it was academic for freedom for creationists in colleges. Um, I don't think that's going to pass. But these bills, they're spreading. And so in 2012, Tennessee passed their own creationism law. For the longest time, Louisiana was number one. We were the only state with a creationism law. That changed. Tennessee passed a bill modeled after ours. And now there's two creationism laws. We saw bills introduced in Oklahoma. We see Oklahoma's had about 26 bills in the last 13 years, I think they gave it, with the most introduced. And it nearly passes. It's, it's come scary close to Oklahoma passing for the last few years. Colorado had a bill this year. Montana. New Hampshire even has bills sometimes. Florida, we see bills just all around the country. And so we have to fight these laws. And that's what I've been doing. It took me a few years to grow up from that high school kid who was afraid of my dad running for Congress. Um, but by my senior year of high school, I realized I had a voice and I had a moral responsibility to use it. And so I began a campaign to repeal the Louisiana Science Education Act. So the first thing I did is contact Dr. Barbara Forrest, who many of y'all may have heard about. She's an absolutely wonderful person and has been fighting this fight in Louisiana and across the country for many years. Um, and I, I got in touch with her and said, like, what, what can I do to take on this law? And she actually, she just, we got started from there. And I had sent her an email on a whim thinking about maybe the campaign and she quickly got back to me and made this a real thing. So we got started working and the first step was to find a legislator to sponsor our bill. The problem is when the Louisiana Science Education Act passed, it passed with it passed unanimously in our state senate and with only three votes against it, about a hundred in our state house. So we, we, we did, the good news is we had a limited group of people we had to ask. And so, <laughs> and so the first person I got in touch with um, was Senator Karen Carter Peterson. She's now, she's now a state senator. She was in the house when the bill passed back in 2008. But she's now a state senator and, and she's from New Orleans. And so I got in touch with her. And I sat down with me with her, and I started going through, this is what the law does, this is why it's bad, this is why it's wrong. She cut me off and said, you don't need to tell me that. When do we get started fighting this? Like, we'll have a bill. And so, at that point, we, we had to be real. And despite that, when everyone, when we began this campaign, everyone told me, you won't even, no one's, they're not gonna let you, your bill be heard. It was a little bit awkward. So Senator Ben Neffers, who sponsored this bill, was also the chairman of the Senate Education Committee where we were having our bill heard at the time. Despite this, he's a kind man, and he would give us a fair hearing. And so he, he had our bill heard, and just like everyone told us, we lost. We lost five to one that year. And so we came back for next, another try next year, and everyone told us, why bother? A bunch of people who were sitting on the sidelines of this fight told me, hey, we can tell you what the vote is going to be before it even happens. Like, don't worry about it. But the thing is, that time we didn't lose five to one. We only lost two to one, which is an incredible result when, when the entire Senate and the entire the entire Senate last time voted against it. And suddenly, there's a change of three people who voted against us who were unwilling to show up and vote after the pressure we put on between the two between the two votes. So we we've, we've had some momentum. Um, despite all this, though, we, like, people still ask why I've done this. We've made we've had amazing progress. Back in 2010, creationists tried to throw out our biology textbooks, and we actually won that fight. And so many of y'all may know about how Texas usually sets a trend for textbook adoptions around the country um, because it's just such a big state. But Texas had put off textbooks, textbook adoptions that year. And so it was actually, Louisiana actually became what was being looked at for the entire country. And if we had thrown out textbooks that taught evolution, we would have had the same effect that if Texas throws out textbooks that teach evolution, which is something we have to worry about very soon, I think. Biology textbooks are up before the State Board of Education this year. And I want to see as many people there telling them, please keep science in our textbooks. So we, we've had some amazing progress. We protect our textbooks. We built a coalition that's like none other in the world. I mean, 40% of living Nobel laureate scientists, that's 78 Nobel laureate scientists, have joined our cause. Major science organizations like the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the full New Orleans City Council endorsed 
this repeal, we've had the, the Orleans Parish School Board ban creationism from their schools in reaction to this law. They also, you all might find funny, they banned uh, Texas-style revisionist history textbooks <laughs> at the same time. So, well, Louisiana may be backwards. New Orleans, is, New Orleans knows what to avoid. <laughs> so, after all of this, though, people ask us why we fight. The fight means we need a scientific revolution, and the repeal of the Louisiana Science Education Act is ground zero of this. This fight may be long, and it may be hard, but as President Kennedy said, when he stood at Rice and launched the scientific revolution, launched our first scientific revolution, we choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win. This fight may be, it may not be easy, we don't fight because it's easy. We have a duty to stand up and launch the scientific revolution. And I think we need a second giant leap for humankind. So again, this fight has expanded. Everyone likes to make fun of Louisiana. When I go on Bill Maher on Friday, I expect him to ask me, well, why is Louisiana so stupid? And you know, it's not, it, this isn't a Louisiana problem though. This is an American problem. So again, the Texas State Board of Education has been trying to sneak creationism through strengths and weaknesses into the biology textbooks. Uh, I mean, and more recently, we thought in Louisiana that Governor Jindal had done all he could to harm science education in our state, but we were wrong. Our governor now passed a school voucher program that takes money from our public schools and gives vouchers to creationists once. And so school choice sounds great. It's, it's really hard to argue if you're in a failing school, can, can you move? But the problem is these schools are worse than the worst failing public schools. And so. In Louisiana, I documented 20 private schools and this program, and probably a lot more. I mean, these were the schools that were very blatant, that had, were getting 1,300 voucher slots initially, and were being given up to 11 million in public money initially, that were teaching creationism with this 11 million in public money. Since then, since the public pressure we put on after that, the, they cut the funding, and now they're only funding 4 million, and they only funded 4 million last year. We're gonna see, they've expanded the program, this year, we found more creationist voucher programs, schools in this expanded program, but they, they did cut it down from 11 million to 4 million. We found schools that said, our position on the age of the earth and other issues is that any theory that goes against God's word is, error, is an error. And this school called scientists sinful men who are just trying to explain the world so they didn't have to be morally accountable to God. And so this is a school receiving public money. There was a school that called, it put in a student handbook as a guideline for their students to defend creationism through evidence presented by the Bible against traditional scientific theory. And so they mandated all their students, we're paying for students to be mandated to fight evolution. Um, Mother Jones picked out the 14 craziest lessons being taught by some of these creationist curriculums used. Um, my favorite is that uh, dragons are real, they were dinosaurs that lived with humans, and they were dragons because they breathed fire through chemical glands in their nose. Um, and uh, I'm also, I'm a history major. And so, it's not my main cause, but seeing really bad revisionist history also hurts me inside. And so, seeing things like the KKK was moral really bothers me. And that was also being taught with some of these curriculums. And so, by the way, I think y'all may appreciate this. One of our state legislators who voted for the voucher program initially decided she was opposed to it. Not because she realized the value of the separation of church and state, but she, when she didn't understand initially that when Religious schools were allowed the program that also included Muslim schools. And she thought religious just meant Christian. And so after a Muslim school applied for the program, she withdrew her support after becoming, after she learned what it actually meant. <laughs> and so, again, thanks to Governor Jindal, all these schools are now funded by millions in taxpayer money. As the New Orleans Times picky and opine, vouchers have turned out to be the answer to a creationist prayer. But again, this isn't just a Louisiana problem, this is an American problem. I did some more research, actually thanks to uh, Senator Dan Patrick. Uh, so last August, I was, in, uh, I was in Texas, I was at Austin to testify about what was happening in Louisiana. And Senator Patrick cut me off during my testimony and asked me, he said, this is only Louisiana, right? And at the time I said, yes sir, I, I, I've only researched Louisiana. But they got me thinking, I wonder if it's only Louisiana. So I decided to research every other voucher program in the country and found out that there's at least 300 schools, probably a lot more, across the country that are teaching creationism and receiving tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions, in public money. 
and it's every, every single program we've managed to look at. So that's nine states, the District of Columbia, and Arizona, we can't, we don't know which school is actually in the program, but every single school in Arizona who's a private school is allowed in their voucher program. So we documented some um, creationist schools who are private who may or may not be participating, if, and we could know if we had the full list. The only state where we didn't find any creationist schools was Mississippi, and that's not because Mississippi doesn't have creationist schools, but there's just no information on the program at all, so we can't really investigate it. So every state we've had any ability to investigate, and I'm sure, given Mississippi, Given Mississippi, I, I would not be shocked if I found some creation schools there. Um, so every state we've investigated, though, is teaching creation. So it seems these programs, despite despite how nice it may be to give kids choice, are fundamentally being used to fund creation schools. And so y'all can actually see on Bill Moyers' website there's a full there's a map of where the creation schools are across the country. You can go if you have friends in another state, you can go pinpoint. If they live in Florida, for example, Florida has about 164 schools we documented. Um, you can go see if they live on the same street as a creationist school getting public money. And coming back to Texas, though, so our governor, Rick Perry, has proven he doesn't understand evolution. He called it a, a theory that's out there, and one that's got some gaps in it. Um, he said, we teach both evolution and creationism in our schools here in Texas. And now, for Governor Perry, here's a message. Teaching creationism is, in public schools isn't just wrong, it's illegal. And so in Louisiana, they may have had a loophole that provides a teacher legal cover. In Texas, we don't even have that. If you teach creationism in Texas schools, it's not on the state, it's on the individual teacher. Um, and so in the 2012 election, it almost felt like creationism became a plank of the Republican Party platform. So look at, look at the pre Republican presidential primary. You've got Rick Santorum, you've got Michelle Bachman, Ron Paul was even a creationist. Newt Gingrich used to love evolution until the primary came around, then he suddenly took that back and became a creationist. Tim Pawlenty had the wrong position on creationism. He said he wanted to leave it up to the states to decide. So my governor, Bobby Jindal, he didn't run in 2012, but uh, I can hazard a guess that he might run in 2016. He, I mean, he supported the Louisiana Science Education Act. He got on, I think it was Face the Nation, I may be wrong on the show, but it called intelligent design creationism the very best science. So th this, this is the wrong attitude. I mean, we need, this isn't, again, this is not just a Louisiana problem, it's an American problem. And we need to stand up and tell these politicians, even if their base likes creationism, uh, like, I know in Bobby Jindal's heart of hearts, he believes, he, he, he's a Brown University biology major and a Rhodes Scholar. He understands exactly how important evolution is to biology and to science. And so we just need to give, give him the courage to stand up there and actually champion real science rather than support creationism. Um, and so again, it's not a, it's a, an American problem. North Carolina tried to outlaw climate, outlaw climate science. They had the uh, ostrich bill where they were trying to stick their head in the sands when, uh, when an ignore sea level rise when building things on the coast. Um, so we need to do this. We need a scientific revolution because our generation will face unprecedented challenges my generation will face unprecedented challenges to our way of living and to our survival as a species. Our population continues to climb, but the amount of clean water and living space we have on Earth is stretched thin. Our climate is growing increasingly extreme. We've discovered superbugs now that are resistant to our, to our antibiotics. Um, the Earth is experiencing a rapid decline in biodiversity, especially in our oceans. And that recent meteorite that exploded over Russia is sort of a sobering reminder of how we can actually face extinction from something that if we just did more research and funded more science for it, we could actually prevent. So these threats do sound like science fiction, but they're real, and my generation will have to address them. The way to overcome these challenges and ensure the long-term survival of our species is through investment in rapid science adva scientific advancement. So we have a choice of two futures ahead of us. In the first, we stay on our present track. We keep teaching creationism and climate change denial. We keep not funding science. The recent budget sequester could cut 50 billion from science in America over the next five years. And so in this future, if we keep this up, we follow these threats. On the other hand, I want to see a reinvestment in science. I want to see a trillion dollars of new science funding in the next decade. I mean, science funding offers a massive return on investment. It offers, it's been calculated 30 to 100 percent return on investment, which when you invest in infrastructure, that's like an 8 percent return. Investment or eight times, but it's like it just doesn't compare to science. 
Um, and so, and the great thing about science is what we discover, unlike a tax credit, it never is going to sunset. Unlike a road, it doesn't need to be repaid. When we discover something, we've discovered it. So, I have a vision where we actually teach evolution, not Noah's flood. Where we teach radiocarbon dating, not creationism. Where we teach climate science, not just plain denial science. And in this future, we learn how to do things. We can harness wave energy better. We actually make algae fuel viable. We actually learn how to turn off cancer cells or even aging. And just like going to the moon, the second giant leap is one, like as President Kennedy said, we are unwilling to postpone. So we have a responsibility to serve our country and make the second giant leap happen. And we, we all have the power to speak out, raise our voices, go to Austin, tell Rick Perry and tell Dan Patrick, don't fund creationist vouchers, don't pass a creationism law. We can go tell Bobby Jindal, stop supporting creationists, and we can tell Michelle Bachman, we can, we can vote out Michelle Bachman. I, 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 won't, I won't pretend she can be saved. Um, <laughs> but but we, we can go, we can tell, we, we need more people like John, John Huntsman running in the Republican primary. John Huntsman said he believed in evolution, except he trusted the scientists on climate change, and said call him crazy. And he must have been crazy to run that race like that, but it was the right position, the right thing to do. So we, we can all raise our voices and be heard and speak out. And I hope you all will join me in that. Thank you all so much. Also, the Americans United is an absolutely wonderful organization who I've worked with very closely on these issues, and I'm really proud to be here with them. Thank you all so much. Thank you very much, Zach. At this time, we're going to take uh, questions from the audience. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a couple questions. Um, when you were working with the various legislators, did you get a sense of what percentage actually believed in their position versus how many were just taking a political uh, position? It's very hard to know because, for example, I, I'm hesitant to actually say what I know exactly what's in their brains because I can't read their minds. Right. Having said that, I know Bobby Jindal, for example, understands evolution. His genetics professor at Brown actually told him not to pull the ladder up on other potential doctors who were once like him who were learning evolution in high school. And he, he chose to take his road scholarship rather than go to med school, but that was, a, that was an easy path. He could have taken that path, and I think he would have been much more appreciative of evolution there. Now, on the other hand, we have senators like uh, Mike Walsworth, who some of y'all may have seen the video of Senator Walsworth, where he was having Richard Lenski's wonderful experiment with E. coli, where you, they basically they freeze E. coli as, it, as sort of the genes change and it evolves, and they can compare and see how it's changed over time. They've done it for about 20 years now. But this was being explained to him, and he cut the teacher, the science teacher off who was explaining it and said, well, does E. coli ever turn to a person? And so I, don't, I, I can't tell you if he believes that, but it does tell me one thing, which is he does, this is why we need to teach evolution. This is why we need a good biology education in our schools. I mean, that's a prime example. Um, as you can tell by our attendance here, this is something that we're all very interested in. And as you can also tell, you're probably young enough to be a lot of our grandsons. So my question is, as, a, as an aging activist, how do we encourage young people like you and even you know your your age group? How do we present these situations to them? What can we say or what means can we use to get you activated? I've only got a few more you know protest rallies and stuff in me. It's time to you know I'm trying to get into like the high schools or or colleges or something to get get young people interested and activated. So I don't think there's a magic word. Um, for me, the reason I chose this cause over any other, for some reason I've always cared about evolution. And I just had the right, I mean I grew up very, very shy. And so this is the unlikely position for me to be in, honestly. Um, I couldn't go speak out to my classmates for a school presentation when I was in high school. And it, it hit the right combination of things for me where I, I was embarrassed, I was angry and I knew it was right. And so I, I never really thought through things. And I just said, this is right, this is the right thing to do, I'm gonna do it. And then I realized after I was already too deep in what the consequences might be. But at that point it was too late. So I think it's more maybe constant persistence, reminding 
I mean, trying to create sort of moral core almost in the kids about this is the right thing, this is why we do it, and then just bringing them out. I mean, I, I try every year in Louisiana, I can bring out my friends from high school. And then <coughs> the first year they came out, a lot of them came out because they're my friends and they wanted to support me. And then we went to committee and we had a legislator insult all the students in the audience and made them all angry. She, this legislator called Nobel laureate scientists people with a bunch of little letters behind their names. She insulted the students. She said, well, I can't believe some of y'all got out of high school with this bad law on the books. Started mocking us. And suddenly the next year, students came out who had been there last year who may, who may have been a one-time thing. If, if that hadn't happened, now they're angry. They saw what their public officials were actually doing. Saw they didn't care about science, didn't care about doing the right thing. And suddenly they were angry and mobilized. And so it's maybe just giving everyone the right care to get out. But how do you sell it to them? How do you sell it to so that it means something to them? I mean, you can't say, guess what, when you're 50 years old, you're probably not going to be able to go to Galveston because it's going to be underwater. Yeah. You know, and they're going to, eh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, if, what, it, do you have any suggestions? Again, I don't think, I don't think there's magic words. I just think it's constant, I mean, there's a lot of, some, like, just exposing them to it. If, if you can expose, me you on know, climate change, for example, if you can expose a kid to the, the map of where their city is, like, if you look at a map of where water's gonna be, New Orleans is gone. Mm -hmm. And so, well maybe if you show it to a kid from New Orleans once, they might not care, but if, they, if they're bombarded with that all the time, suddenly suddenly things might change, suddenly they, they may become more interested in taking a stand on it. And so I think, I think it's just persistence. Well, I'll say I found out about this through Facebook. Like I had no idea this was going on. I've, I'm over at U of H with my friend Oscar here. And uh, you know, I was just kind of going through some of my you know, like anti-creationist Facebook pages that I'm a member of. And, uh, and I saw an article about you, and I was like, oh, that's cool. And then I saw you were at Rice University, and I was like, like, like I've got it. I've got to come and, come and check it out. And so that's how I'm here. Yeah, I mean, social media is very good at spreading things. And it, I mean, on the, on the activism part for me, it's more I'm, I will post things to go about 300 Facebook groups when there's something needs to be done. I'll send it out to several thousand people every time. I say, here's, someone, here's the state legislator's phone number and email. Please call him and tell him why evolution is real. <laughs> and that does, that does have an effect on them sometimes. Um, I think another thing, uh, it's, it's not that our generation doesn't care, but maybe we, we kind of spread ourselves too thin and maybe have too many causes so we don't, like Zach, you've been great because you focus in on this one issue and you've been able to bring about a lot of good changes in this one issue. So if you not only expose them to all of the issues that are out there, um, well, if you do so in such a way that they can find which one they're passionate about, and then encourage them to pursue it, just like Zach has pursued science education, to pursue it with all their heart and you know, put their all into it, and then you can bring about good change. The hardest step is the first step, I think. Yeah. Once you're involved, then goes from there. Um, so two questions. The first is, um, how can college students who aren't in a science-related field get involved with this? Um, for instance, like I'm a humanities major. I'm not that well, well, well versed in science, but it's still something I care about. And the second question is, well, in terms of like the way you argue this like in the Senate and through like your activism, um, do you think that when it comes down to politicians who do genuinely believe in creationism, that public figures such as Dawkins, Harris, and the late Hitchens um, actually like aggravate the situation and make them um, cling on to their position even more, or do they help alleviate it in any way? So the fir on the first question, I mean, I'm, a, I'm a history major, and so here's the thing: it's like I understand evolution at the basic level, at least. But if you ask me, explain this very specific thing at the cutting edge of the science. I'm going to say, honestly, I have no idea. And I'll say, but that's not my job. I mean, I can, if you really want an answer and want me to go bother someone like Ken Miller, who's written a very popular science textbook, I can go ask and get an explanation. There's always a scientist who has a better explanation for the natural phenomenon that I can give. Because I'm just, I'm not a scientist. And so you learn to rely on and work with the people who are the best in the world at this. And then there's a lot of things on the internet. Um, there's the Berkeley Understanding Evolution page. There's the Talk Origins Archive that just rebuts all the creationist arguments. Um, the National Center for Science Education has a lot of resources that are absolutely great. 
And so between those, that sort of gets you the basis you need, I think, to, to say, okay, look, there's people who know this, it's not my job to explain this, that's the researcher's job, and then being able to refer people to um, the important materials if you need to. That, that's, that's sort of the biggest hurdle, I think, as a non-scientist. Um, and then to get involved, it's just you get started. You've, so let's see, say Texas passed the Zettler Bill, which would provide intelligent design uh, proponents in colleges academic freedom to pursue their research without any negative repercussions. I think it's sort of a dumb bill, um, and it's not going to pass. But say that were to pass and someone had a strong opposition, it just, it's real, I mean, you can email, all your state legislators' emails are public. Um, you can email them and see, it, go, it goes to their staff, but when you, when you get in touch with the staff, suddenly you can start a relationship with them and, and start working on the issue. Um, and the, second, the second question was about... Uh, so the second question was um, regarding like, po those politicians who actually do genuinely believe in creationism and um, people like Dawkins and Hitchens, the late Hitchens, who have like, a very specific way of arguing that does that make those politicians like want to cling on to their beliefs more or does it help alleviate um, the situation in your opinion? So I gave the example of Mike Walsworth earlier. I don't think Walsworth knows who Dawkins or Hitchens really are and I don't think, I don't think he'd really care. In the end he probably wouldn't like him wouldn't like them, but I don't think it has really any effect on these politicians because they, it's, they're more worried about their own constituents and not what some random famous atheist, for example, says um, publicly in one of his books. And so what I, think, I think in the end, though, it is just a generational thing. So as we educate more students about evolution, slowly, hopefully we can overcome that 46% of the population that supposedly believes the Earth was created in the last 10,000 years. What? It's that the percentage is that large? Well, it, it's an interesting thing because that was what the Gallup poll said, but the Gallup poll isn't exactly too well written on the issue, so I'm not sure the actual. I, I don't entirely trust the numbers. If it's even close to that, it's scary. It, it, it is. It is too. It is far too large, and that that, that is the point. That also, also needs to be made. Even if it's not voice, even if it dropped down to as low as maybe 35 percent, which which may be, which may, I may be hope I may be too hopeful on that if I said that. That's still way too large. So, but it, the Gallup poll did say 46% last time. I have a couple of questions. Number one, can you name someone who was helpful to you who was in the legislature in Louisiana? Are there any particular legislators in Texas who've been helpful? Um, I haven't worked with anyone specifically in the legislature in Texas, luckily, because we have, I haven't needed to. I've talked with Scott Hochberg before. And he, he's not there anymore, but he's absolutely great has been a good resource for me um, and, outside of it. And when you say that you don't think that this creationism bill uh, will pass, is that because it's not going to get out of committee? Um, and if that's the case, who's the, is, is Dan Patrick the chair of the committee? Yes. Yeah. The chair of education. Dan Patrick's the chair. I think, I think it's less of just, it's, it's sort of so far out there that it has, there's no motivation for anyone to push it rather than getting killed specifically. I'd make that distinction because you something, for example, in Louisiana, we have some bills, we have a birth, we had a Ten Commandments bill, for example, that it got killed, it, there was a lot of support for it, but it got killed because people were trying to amend onto it that they had put an escrow fund about $10 million to, for legal defense if they wanted to pass it, rather than it just someone introduced it, like people introduce a bunch of legislation that sometimes crazy, sometimes not, that just doesn't get heard. And so I think it's more on the second, it's just, it's not, it's not a priority for anyone, so it's not going to happen. Um, I'm curious, what have you been doing since you got to, to Houston to write, uh, in terms of like activism? So my big push in Texas has actually been on the vouchers because that they, so I went to committee in August last year and I, I, it was an interesting experience for me because they were talking about how Louisiana was a great model and how we should follow that. <laughs> so I, I, went, I went and testified and um, told them we shouldn't follow that model. It's, I'm very hopeful the vouchers don't pass because the House doesn't seem very supportive. And I, I'm sort of watching that, waiting to see what happens. That, that's been the big thing I'm fighting for in Texas. And then biology textbooks are going to come up for adoption this year for the State Board of Education. And we'll see what happens with those. Um, because, so the president of the board has promised to, be, I don't have, how many of y'all have seen the revisionaries? 
So we no longer have Don McElroy, the creationist dentist who most famous for saying someone needs to stand up the experts. Um, yeah. And so he so we don't have him anymore. It, it, we're hopeful that it's going to be a little bit better this year, but it's also, there's always this mess in Texas. This always happens where it's always a debate over it. So that's going to be the next big thing, I think. I was going to say, um, so everything that, like all the activities and stuff are thinking about doing, is that all on the state level, or are there things on the national level to be done, even though the, the education is mostly involved with the state? So the national level is more of the second track league where that's going to be a big push for science funding because the state level, there, there could be, for example, Obama could issue an executive order that bans all these academic freedom laws and says, look, you can have academic freedom, but if you want to sneak creationism into the classroom under these laws, that's not allowed. Or we could pass something in Congress, although that may be a little bit harder. Um, but, but mainly right now, on the state level, we're sort of playing whack-a-mole with creationist bills coming up and vouchers and all, the, all these different things. Um, but on the national level, it's fighting the sequester, which I'm very hopeful will be rolled back, but I'm not seeing much progress on that right now. Um, and then getting a new science funding bill in Congress, because even if the sequester gets rolled back, that means we're staying stagnant, which is really sad. Um, I mean, we're, we're going to decline now, so we at least need to get back to the, the, the right level, but we, we should be funding a lot more. I mean, science funding, the Fed calculated optimal science funding was about four times what we have now. Um, I mean, it's, I'm not an economist, I don't really want to throw that around too much, but that, that would be more of our push nationally. In Louisiana, <coughs> when you started, you were faced with overwhelming odds in the legislature. Mm -hmm. le legislature. Uh, do you have any kind of lessons learned on how you were able to overcome that? Um, I and mean, it wasn't a one-man show. Uh, what was your strategy and what did you do right and do wrong? Um, so, do, do right, but it's just persistence. I mean, you have to keep, you have to ignore the critics, you have to just keep organizing people, call, email everyone you can, and just make as much noise as humanly possible. That's what we've been doing, it's just, we've been, we've been this has been an issue in the news. When you say we, who are you talking about? Me, I mean, it's a sort of broad quote, the Louisiana Coalition for Science, um, all these groups, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, who joined on the Nobel laureates, the sort of phenomenal people we have who've come in and endorsed this bill, um, and just it's been there's been constant noise made for two years about this, and we we tell tell everyone talk to your friend, have them talk to five friends, and tell them to talk to five friends, and tell them all to call their legislators, and we keep we keep making more noise, and there's phone calls, emails stacking up in the legislators' offices, and slowly. Even if they're not coming to our sides immediately, they're no longer against us. And so that, that's what we've done right. And what, what I wish we could have done, I wouldn't really say do wrong, the thing about the Louisiana Science Education Act is it's wickedly hard to track down what's actually being done under it. Because it's all a teacher's prerogative, and actually some of these groups, we know some of the supplemental material is being used. The problem is they, mail specific, they don't even tell the schools about the supplemental materials. They actually stipulate the publishers of the materials Tell us your name, your home address, and what school you work for. We're going to send it to your home address so no one can track it. And that just makes it, like, I, so I can send a public records request to the school and make it nothing back because the school doesn't even know what their teacher is teaching outside the curriculum. And so I wish, and what, what I need to do, I think, is now just go through and try and find out, find people, schools in Louisiana, who are willing to come out and say, this is what we're being taught. Find s someone who slips up and publicly use, shows the materials and find something because it's, that's what we get constantly attacked on. We have evidence of what school boards are doing with this law. We have the quotes from the sponsors. We have the model from Discovery Institute, which really was a brainchild behind academic freedom creationism laws. It's a creationist think tank in Seattle. But we don't have any direct evidence because it's, it's really hard for us to be in the schools while it's being taught. You mind uh, mentioning, discussing the Texas Freedom Network? Sure. The Texas Freedom Network is a wonderful organization um, that if, I, I think most of you all probably have heard of them, but they, they really, they're an on the ground network in Texas to fight all these bad laws that never really come up. Um, they recently put out a big, I mean this is sort of unrelated, but I saw they put out a, this is a big week in separation of church and state for them. They had a list of bills that they want people to go tell their legislators to vote no on. 
Um, and they fight the school board. Fight, the they fight the school yeah. board. Kathy Miller is great. And I, I've met with them a couple times this year. Um, and so they're, they're another good organization like the AU, like the National Center for Science Education to go support, I'd say. And I wish we had the on-the-ground network like y'all do in Texas and Louisiana. And that, that comes with size. I think y'all, 32 million people, were 4 million, which is just a little bit of a difference. But it'd be nice to have that. There's a Texas Freedom Network student organization at U of H. Yeah, there's not one at Rice. They've been talking to me about that. But yeah. I, I mean, I'm not, I don't run an organization like that. And I'm actually about to take a year off or two years off to go pursue this full time. But I know they want one at Rice. Well, you just uh, answered the first question I was going to ask you, and that is, what are your immediate plans? And the second question is, uh, for those of us in the audience who might be interested in following what you're up to and maybe uh, uh, helping out in some way or other, uh, how can we do that? Um, I mean, so the big thing for me right now is social media. I use Facebook and Twitter to put stuff out. I am, we're, we're, we have a website in the works for Second Giant Leap where we're going to try and get an email list on that, but that's, that has to be built for, first. I'm not a website designer. I'm waiting on people to do it. Um, I'm working with some people to do it for me. And so when that comes, it'll come and I'll put that out publicly and hopefully get people on board. But I, I can't really say um, that right now because I don't have it. Um, but that, that'd, be, that'd be the larger infrastructure we'd be building soon. What's your Twitter? Um, Zach Coplin. I think you just, I think you said this, but it does seem to me that in Texas we do we do face a threat from the prospect of stealth vouchers, yeah. and that's something we probably all need to be alert for. Yeah. And you can go to the TFM website, yeah. for example, as gentleman suggested, you suggested, just to know what's out there yeah. and what 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 bills are threatening, and then anybody you know who's yourself or anybody else who's willing to testify in Austin. Yeah. I know, can do so. Yeah, on the vouchers, there's sort of there's a distinction that they often try to make where, in Texas, they're trying to fund it through tax credits. In Louisiana, they give it straight to the, to the schools. But either way, it's still vouchers, and I'd argue still just as wrong and honestly absurd. Um, anyone else? Right. Are there any particular legislators that we could support that would be in supporting this? Um, in Texas, I, I don't know the politics on the ground as well, so I, I, I would be hesitant to say that. I will say Dan Patrick is one to oppose. So I don't know, I, I don't know a ton about the like, legal issues here, but it seems to me that, that such laws like promoting the teaching of intelligent design or creationism or whatever they shot at him are blatant violations of the First Amendment. Um, or I mean, in, in the sense that Congress should make no law promoting one religion over another, and yes, I guess like what are the there are the specific challenges here? Are those in like the language? Like is freedom from religion also? Like, something so so the thing is, it, the first part is looking at the makeup of the current Supreme Court. People are very wary of challenging things right now, just because. While we may be right, no one wants to set bad precedent when someone like Scalia writes a really nasty um, decision that smacks down fundamental parts of the First Amendment, basically. So that, that's one problem. Um, the, the second is the Louisiana Science, uh, Science Education Act, for example, never says creation is a more intelligent design. It just opened, it sort of they made the, we opened the door and the dog ran out. We didn't mean for the dog to run out, it just ran out. You can't, you can't say we did it on purpose. And, now, and so the Louisiana Science Education Act appears to violate one of the problems in the Lemon Test where the sponsor said it was for creationism. But it's, it's, a, very, it's a very shaky thing, and we don't, I don't think anyone wants to challenge it until we can challenge it not just on the language, but also on how it's been applied. And we're waiting for some student to come out and say, hey, like they taught me creationism <laughs> under this law in my school. I want to sue it. And that, that's, some, that's, that's what it really takes is where we have standing, where we are, where we can really mount a challenge that is going to be really hard for someone like Scalia to throw out um, on some whatever grounds you can think of. So, um, what about the kids who have already had this notion of creationism ingrained into their brains? Is it too late for them? What can we do to help them? <laughs> I, I, 
I hope I hope it changes. Sometimes it does. Hopefully, that critical thinking thinking gene. So, like, I mean, if, if, yeah. If if I could change the Louisiana Family Forum, for example, the creationist group who funds all the stuff in Louisiana, I'd love to change and help have them understand evolution. I mean, I can't really do that, and I don't think anyone, any of us can. If you have a friend who believes in creationism, you can always give them the evidence and hope it works. It's just it's much easier to teach a student than try and give it to someone who's not a student. And again, as more and more kids get taught evolution, I think the population will slowly change. Yeah, Zach, on, on that question about people who are not in a scientific field and so forth, um, everybody should understand what the scientific method is, yes. uh, and specifically what the word theory means in the real world. I own a creationist textbook, for example, that, that's used in some of these voucher schools, and it very dramatically misuses what theory and hypothesis and law are. And it, it's, it's a shame because it's, a theory is just an explanation that we've made to explain natural phenomena. It's a set of facts, and it's been well tested. It's not, and that doesn't mean there's not a hierarchy of like a fact theory law. Like I like to see, like creationists like to like throw a law at the top of like the heap, which is really not how it works. It's, it's always a little bit weird to see, but it's like, it, it is just a fundamental misunderstanding of the scientific method, and it is a problem, because if I, even if I, even if I'm not a biologist, if I'm a, if I, if I want to study chemistry, for example, and suddenly I think, well, the scientific method doesn't, I don't understand because I was taught, well, creationism is just as valid science as evolution, therefore we're going to redefine science, then suddenly you're going to have a lot of trouble in your chemistry class, too, if you think that way. Do you have any idea what percentage of uh, the politicians that are supporting this are doing it for political reasons to uh, prop up one leg of the Republican Party versus the people that really, really, really have heard it from their preachers and believe it? No idea. I mean, it's just hard to tell. I, I wish, I mean, and I, I assume it varies from state to state, from place to place. There's sometimes some subtle political influences that help us out. My understanding is that the rural legislators oppose vouchers, for example, because they don't have private and parochial schools to send their kids to in their district. So if you, the more you put vouchers in, the more it's taking money out of their schools and putting them into other places. Similar that you get a lot of conservatives in the state legislature who are now interested in alternatives to incarceration because of the fact that it allows us to stop um, uh, spending money on building and maintaining prisons, and therefore they don't, we don't have to raise taxes uh, in order to deal with those issues. So I guess my question is, are there any other similar economic um, things at play here that, that, that give us a non-ideological reason for, uh, uh, for appealing to conservatives in the legislature? So the examples I give are the New Orleans Bio District wants scientists from Louisiana. But if Louisiana students are taught, aren't taught evolution and they don't go to great colleges around the country and go even like learn enough to be in an LSU or Tulane biology class, then they're not going to get hired f by these Louisiana companies. And we're going to bring in more people from out of state to extract our oil, to do our own genetic research, to work in our own companies, and not have our own students do this stuff. So that's one thing. And Louisiana is actually being boycotted by a science organization publicly, and probably by a lot more, not as officially as the Society for Integrative and Comparative Biology has. The Society for Integrative and Comparative Biology actually pulled a convention from New Orleans back after the law passed. I've been talking to them, they've agreed, since New Orleans has, the New Orleans City Council has called for repeal of the Louisiana Science Education Act, and New Orleans public schools have banned creationism. That they, New Orleans is now back under consideration for a convention, although we lost our first one. But the rest of the state is still under boycott. And there's other organizations who are probably doing that. So that's, that's another point that gets made. Is it does hurt for Louisiana, which is a state very dependent on tourism. It does hurt us to scare away.